Alright, so let's get into chapter 3 a little bit. Uh, chapter 3, introduction. Start talking about energy. So as we said in the beginning, chemistry is the study of matter. And we talked about matter being almost everything. It's not abstract. That's not energy. But then we said chemistry is not just the study of matter. It's also the study of the interaction between matter and energy. So other than abstract ideas, Chemistry is really the study of everything. It's matter and energy. Those are really the two big things that are in existence. So we need to be able to categorize and communicate about energy as just as we've learned to com categorize and communicate about matter. So the first type of energy discussed here is kinetic energy. And as we said, that is the energy of a particle in motion. So kinetic energy one formula that describes that is this formula here. This is the formula that describes only one type of kinetic energy. The main type you would think of, right? So if you're in your car driving down the street, the energy of that car, the kinetic energy of the car, depends on how fast it's moving and how heavy it is. Right? That's why you'd probably rather get hit by someone on a bicycle than someone in a bus. Even if they're going the same speed, whatever has more mass has more energy. Right? But that equation, which we talked about, describes how much energy something has as it's moving through space. That type of motion that this describes is called translational motion. Translational motion is the motion an object has if it's traveling from point A to point B. So when we talked about this, we said it's relevant to us as chemists because even though we're not really concerned about how fast a car is going in chemistry lab, we're more concerned with thermal energy. But thermal energy is a measure of kinetic energy. Right? So we said, when we're in this, everyone got the quiz right, you guys did a great job with that. We said, when you're looking at temperature or thermal energy, you're looking at how much are these particles moving? Right? What's the average speed of the particle? But particles in a sample don't just have translational motion, they have other types of motion as well. But there's not a lot of translational motion in a solid. Right? Because if I have like a the top of the table here, it's a solid, right? It's not a liquid or a gas. In a solid, the particles are held close together, they have attractions, but they're still moving. They don't have translational motion much. Right? An individual molecule that's making up this tabletop. It's not moving and sliding around past the other molecules. That would make it a liquid if it were doing that. So what type of motion do solids primarily have? They have kinetic energy, right? I can still measure the temperature of this. That means the molecules are still moving. It's not at zero Kelvin. The molecules aren't just sitting there. They're still moving around. The type of motion that they have is vibrational. And that requires a different equation to describe. And then there's one other type of motion. Anyone have an idea what it is? For particles in a sample? Potential. Well, potential energy is a separate type of energy. So potential energy doesn't require us to think about the particles in motion. Kinetic energy requires us to think about the particles in motion. There are three main types of motion. Translational, vibrational, and rotational. All right, so a particle, a particle could be sitting in space, vibrating. That would be vibrational motion. It could be traveling through space. That could be, that's translational motion. Or it could be rotating on an axis. That's rotational motion. Or it could be doing all three. Right, so we think about these molecules moving around. We have to keep in mind that all three of these types of motion are going on for the particle. And all three of them contribute to temperature. Right, so if I, have a, if I heat up this countertop and I make it really hot, and the temperature of the countertop becomes more than the temperature of, say, the air in the room, that means the particles in the table have more motion on average than the air particle. Which seems weird because we think about gases, we normally think of the particles in a gas 
as having the ability to move very freely and they're traveling through space pretty fast. Right? The difference is the particles in the gas have primarily translational motion, right? They're flying through space. The particles in the table have primarily vibrational motion. So when I'm measuring temperature, I have to consider all three of those combined. So I don't want to just, I don't want to only think about the translational motion component of, of, of the types of motion that particles can undergo. Because the temperature of a sample depends on all three of those types of motion. If it's a hot temperature, it's got some combination of these that adds up to a lot of motion. It could be just a ton of vibrational motion and making that sample really, really hot solid. Or it could, you know, if it's a very cold sample, it might not have much of those motion uh, types of motion, right? So that's really what temperature is all about. So then the other type of energy that we're going to primarily focus on, we'll talk about light energy as well a little bit later, but for today, kinetic energy, which includes those three types of motion for particles, and potential energy, which has to do with the potential for something to move due to an attraction that's acting on it. Right? So potential energy comes in a couple forms. There's potential energy that's due to the uh, attraction of gravity. We talked about that. But in chemistry, we're usually working with tiny particles and expressing their behavior. So in that case, we're usually talking about electrostatic force. Right? So we know that there are positively charged particles and negatively charged particles. If I've got a sample with a bunch of these particles of opposite charges, I want to avoid the like charges being close together and I want to arrange them so the opposite charges are close together and attract. Right? That's the most stable, lowest energy arrangement. And when it comes to potential energy, what you want to, what you want to keep in mind is that stability or s something that's stable is going to be low in potential energy. And so, just like with gravity, something has a lot of potential, it's unstable because it has the potential to fall down due to the attraction of gravity that, that's acting on it. Same thing for charges. If I have opposite charges and they're arranged in a way that's not stable because they don't have very many attractions. So if it's unstable or if it's stable and it's low in potential energy, that's the same as saying it, it's arranged to maximize attractions. So if I'm forming attractions, that makes it more stable, that makes it lower in potential energy. Right? So particles are charged and I pull them apart, I have to put energy in to do that. They're not just going to fly apart on their own. Like if I have two magnets or two charged particles that are attracting and I want to move them apart, it takes effort for me to do that. I have to pull against their attraction holding that together and to pull them apart, I have to put energy in. So when I go to a point where there's high potential energy, I have to put energy in to get to that point. That's why it becomes higher in energy after I pull them apart. And so when it's unstable, it's high in potential energy, and that results from breaking attractions or arranging things in a way where the attractions are not maximized. Right, so that's what provides chemical energy. When we're talking about chemical energy, usually we're talking about fuels, like gasoline or jet fuel or firewood. You know, it's something you're going to burn or something that's going to act as a fuel Ultimately, the ability of that fuel to produce energy has to do with the fact that the atoms and molecules that are in that fuel to begin with are not arranged in a way where they make the best use of their attraction. Right? When I think about fuel, maybe you're talking about the wintertime where you're heating your home, you use natural gas, that's methane. That's a carbon and four hydrogens. And when that methane comes in contact with oxygen in the air, the arrangement of charged particles in methane and oxygen, the arrangement of the protons and electrons in methane and oxygen, is not the most stable way to arrange the charged particles. It has the potential to release energy and heat your home because it's not stable to begin with. It's somewhat unstable. The arrangement of protons and electrons is not optimal to maximize the number of attractions. So if you rearrange that, and you produce CO2 and water, 
Instead, now the attractions between the particles are stronger. It's more stable. So it's less stable. It becomes more stable. It has a higher relative potential energy and now it has a lower potential energy. That's a fuel because if it starts off with some higher potential energy, it's got the potential to release that energy when the fuel is burned. And that's based on the arrangement of the charged particles. So if I can change the arrangement and make more attractions, it will always release energy. That relates to the quiz question. The quiz question was, if you've got a sample or a system where potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, what will happen to the temperature? You all got that right. But this is a great, this is a great example of that. Right? Because methane and oxygen are, you know, if they're sitting in the room, they're at room temperature. They're not at a high temperature, but they have potential energy because there's a different way I could arrange the charged particles to make it more stable. And so when I take this arrangement of the particles and I convert it into this arrangement of the particles, now it's more stable. It started at a high potential energy, it goes to a low potential energy. That difference in energy is converted into kinetic energy and the kinetic energy is expressed as a temperature change and that's what makes it your home a higher temperature when you turn the heat on if, you, if your home is heated by natural gas. Questions about that? So the best fuels are the ones that have the greatest potential to release energy. The ones that start as being really unstable and with an arrangement of charged particles that's really unstable and if you change that arrangement you can make it much more stable. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Pressure is a uh, pressure is potential energy, right? So, the pressure of if you take a gas and you compress it, the gas inside of that container is made up of these tiny particles moving around. So, if you take out the 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 component of temperature for a moment, you just think about the pressure. Compressing the gas means now there's more force on the inside of that container. So that gas compressed, um, it's not that you are, that potential energy isn't necessarily due to electrostatics, it's more due to, um, it's, it's really kind of its own type of potential energy uh, due to the fact that those particles are colliding and moving around and they're constantly creating a force on the inside of the container. Um, the temperature component of that is a little bit complex because it has to do with friction and things like that. So um, that's more of a complicated example than I would probably ask you to, to analyze. Um, <clears throat> so as the quiz question demonstrated, ki uh, kinetic energy and potential energy are often interconvertible. Right? So you can have a sample that's stable and has low potential energy. And if you've got low potential energy, so in the, just to point out, the last example we had high potential energy, we went to low potential energy, right? That released heat into the environment because that potential energy was converted into kinetic energy. We could also have a low potential energy. We could have a stable situation. We could have a very stable arrangement of charged particles where the charged particles are already forming attractions, like the attractions between a nucleus and the electrons that are surrounding it. If I want to break that attraction and convert it into a situation where those charged particles are farther apart, that cannot happen unless I put energy in. I can't go from low potential energy to high potential energy. Now there's higher potential because the attractions are trying to pull that back together. There's a potential for it to move back to its original location. But I can't go from low potential energy to high potential energy without putting energy in. So the most common way to move an electron away from the nucleus is to add light. We need some form of energy to convert low potential energy into high potential energy. So kinetic energy and potential energy are interconvertible. That also includes light energy. That's also part of that interconversion. I can take potential energy and convert it to light. I can take light and convert it to potential. I can take light energy and convert it to kinetic energy. 
depending on how you set things up, you can convert one form of energy into another. As long as you don't create or destroy energy, you can always convert one form of energy into another form of energy. So let's look at uh, question 3.4 and discuss that idea real quick. So question 3.4 th throws at us some common things we're familiar with and they want us to describe the types of interconversions of energy going on. So part A says you throw a softball up into the air and you catch it. So is there a conversion from one form of energy to another during that process? Right, so when I've got the softball in my hand, etc., how much kinetic energy does it have? Yeah, it doesn't have any, right? It's just sitting in my hand. It's not moving. There's no motion. On a, on a, on a microscopic scale, the individual particles inside the softball are moving. That's what gives the, part of the softball its temperature. But on a macroscopic scale, if we're just thinking of the softball as a particle, it doesn't have any motion, so its kinetic energy is zero. If I throw it up in the air, what happens to its kinetic energy while it's in the air? It goes up, right? Because it goes from zero motion to some motion as it's flying up in the air. Where did that energy come from? It came from me. I have to exert energy on it. So I have potential energy in my muscles that I use to chemically, some ke uh, chemical reactions happen that release energy and that energy is expressed in the form of kinetic energy that makes the softball go up. What happens to the softball's kinetic energy when it reaches its peak? At that s single moment in time where the softball is at its peak, its kinetic energy is zero. It's not moving anymore for that instant. So as I use my potential energy to make the softball go up, what hap as the softball is traveling up, it's kinetic, it, it, it starts with a lot of speed, its kinetic energy is high in the beginning. As it travels higher and higher and higher, it's slowing down. Its kinetic energy is going down. As its kinetic energy is going down, what's happening to its potential energy? It's going up because now it has a potential to fall. So when it's at its peak, then it, has, it doesn't have any kinetic energy, but it has a lot of potential energy because now at its peak it has a potential to fall back down. So then as it falls, that potential energy is going down and being converted back into kinetic energy as it's expressing that energy in the form of motion instead of in the, the potential to move. So while it's moving through air, its temperature increases due to friction? Or so <coughs> probably the temperature is not going to change much because the temperature is an expression of the kinetic energy of the individual particles that make up the softball. And unless they collide with something or uh, have something collide with them, they're probably not going to start moving faster or slower. Um, so looking at the next one, switch on a flashlight. What type of conversion of energy is happening there? Yeah, there's electrostatic potential energy in the battery of the flashlight, and that's getting converted into light primarily, but also into heat. Right, so a battery has in it two sides, a positive side and a negative side. And they're separated from one another until I connect that battery to the components of the flashlight and complete the circuit. The negative side has something that's unstable because the electrons are not held closely to the nucleus. So the electrons don't attract well to the nuclei that are holding them. On the other side of the battery, there's something that attracts the electrons even better. So once that circuit is completed, those electrons can travel to the side that they're more attracted to. That's the potential. There's potential energy in a battery because there's a potential for the electrons to move from one place to another and form better attractions. So initially, that gets converted to kinetic energy as the electrons flow and that motion or flow is an expression of kinetic energy, motion of the electron. But some of that energy also gets converted to light as the battery, as the battery uh, components uh, heat up the filament of a light bulb and that gives off light energy and some of the energy is converted to heat uh, as, the, as the flashlight heats up a little bit as well. 
Uh, you strike a match and let it burn completely. That one also has potential energy converted to both light and heat. Right, so striking the match, there's some type of fuel embedded in that match, and when you strike it, initially you're using the kinetic energy, the motion of striking the match to uh, create that, uh, to start off that potential energy reaction, but ultimately it's the potential energy of the unstable substances on the match head that burns and gets converted into light and heat. So it's very similar to the fuel example where the, the atoms on the match head and the electrons are not forming very strong attractions, but when they react with oxygen in the air, they have the potential to, to rearrange and form more, better attractions. So the potential energy goes down, it's converted into light energy and kinetic energy in the form of heat. So there's no chemical energy involved in there? Like so saying chemical energy is, chemical energy is a type of potential energy. So yeah, there's definitely chemical energy uh, because those chemicals have the potential to rearrange and form stronger attractions when they, after they rearrange. So that's a type of potential energy. So let's look at this other simulation here real quick before we take another break. So this one is mostly about kinetic energy. And it's just a visual way of helping you understand how kinetic energy works and how it's transferred uh, from one place to another. So this first one demonstrates the difference between, uh, this first one demonstrates primarily we're looking at translational motion here, right? So these particles aren't really vibrating or rotating. But one key thing about this that we saw before is when we have a sample, this will be like a sample of a gas because the particles aren't sticking together or attracting at all. But in this sample of the gas, the particles are flying around what we notice is some of them are moving fast and then they get sometimes they collide with other particles and they transfer some of that speed right so how is kinetic energy transferred from one particle to another particle through a collision right they have to collide right so unless this particle collides it flies through space and then it hits something and that causes it to change its direction when it hits something it might slow down if it transfers some of its kinetic energy to the other thing or if the other thing was moving fast, it might transfer some of its kinetic energy to, to the original particle, and so the, trans, the, the kinetic energy is constantly transferring. And as a result, some of the particles are moving kind of slow, and then some of the particles are moving much faster. All right, the temperature measures the average amount of kinetic energy in the sample. So if I maintain the same temperature, but I look at a sample with heavier particles, what do I expect to see? Right, so I'm at the same temperature. Do these particles have more or less kinetic energy than I saw with the previous example? Think about it before you answer. I'm at the same temperature. Do they have more or less kinetic energy than they had to begin with? Yeah, it was kind of a tri tricky way to phrase the question. It's the same. It's neither nor it's neither more nor less. So the temperature is what defines the average kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy is affected by both the speed and the mass. So if my particles are heavier, they have to be moving slower to be at the same kinetic energy. Right? So visually if I say, well, what happened to the kinetic energy? You're like, well, they're moving slower, so there's less kinetic energy. But kinetic energy is not just about speed, it's also about mass. So in this sample, the speed is less but the kinetic energy is the same, okay? So if I ever ask you about kinetic energy, the only thing that's relevant to that is the temperature. If you know two samples are at the same temperature, they have to have the same average kinetic energy. Regardless of the mass or the speed, if you know one sample is at a higher temperature, it has a higher average kinetic energy. So likewise, if I go to an even heavier mass, then I see it looks like they're moving really slow, they still have the same kinetic energy because they're at the same temperature. The only difference is the particles are a lot heavier. And so they are able to maintain the same kinetic energy because kinetic energy is based on both mass and speed. <coughs> this one here is just meant to show you that the average is the same in any given area. So this box here, if I'm looking in the box, I can look at the average 
kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy is based on the temperature. So if I were to move this box somewhere else, I would still have the same average kinetic energy for the particles anywhere I put that box. So that's really not a big surprise. This one illustrates the transfer of kinetic energy from one side of a container to another. So in two seconds, they're going to open that up. This side has more kinetic energy. It's moving faster. The only way the other sample can get more kinetic energy is if the particles start to come in there and collide. Right? So kinetic energy is transferred, or temperature or heat, thermal energy is transferred by particles colliding with other particles. And so eventually both sides reach the same temperature. And so if you think that there's some magical way that heat moves from one place to another, it can't do that if there's nothing in between to allow collisions between the areas that are transferring the energy. So a, probably a better illustration of that is this one here. So I'm going to start off with a vacuum in between my two samples. So which sample <coughs> is at a higher temperature? Well, we have a temperature here. So we can see the green sample is at a higher temperature, the blue sample is at a lower temperature. They can be in the same container, but they're both solids and there's no gas or anything in between them. There's no way for them to transfer the energy. This one substance will always be hotter than the other. So transferring temperature or kinetic energy requires there to be collisions. So if I put a bar between them and do the same thing, now I have the ability to transfer those collisions. Right, so this is like one big solid, this started off hot, and the, the vibration got uh, caused the bar to vibrate more, which caused the next layer of atoms to vibrate more, and then all eventually all the atoms are eventually vibrating at the same rate, and all, they're all at the same temperature. I can do the same thing with a gas. Right, so now instead of a vacuum, I've got a gas in between. So what happens is the slow moving gas particles, when they come in here, and they get hit by these fast vibrating things. That makes the gas particles move faster. They fly over here and transfer some of that energy to the other side. It takes a while. So a gas is a pretty decent insulator because gas is mostly empty space. And it takes a while for the, the motion of one sample to be transferred to another sample. Right? So if you want to insulate your home, what do you use? Use this foam or whatever that has a lots of packets of air trapped in it. So the air can't flow, but you've got this air sitting there. It's a good insulator because it doesn't transfer energy through collisions very often since it's mostly empty space. Uh, it'd be much better if you had a foam that would had like vacuum area sealed in it. That would be a great insulator. Only problem with that is it's hard to keep a vacuum and eventually air would get into that vacuum. So you'd end up with the same thing you started with in a short period of time. Any questions about those? One other way that uh, temperature can be uh, transferred is through light. So sometimes when you have a hot sample, not sometimes, but pretty much all the time, that motion or kinetic energy will sometimes be spontaneously converted into light. So if I heat that up a lot, if you heat up a sample and it, it starts to glow, eventually, I'm doing it, I'm sure why. maybe I need to heat it more. Eventually, those samples, some of the kinetic energy of the sample will be uh, converted into light energy and they're just you know, showing the beams of light coming out. So if your sample is hot enough, even if there's a vacuum between the sample and another sample, if it's irradiating light and some of that kinetic energy is being converted to light energy, that could heat, heat the other sample up. That's how the Earth heats up. Right? There's basically a vacuum between us and the sun. So the sun is releasing all this light energy. The sun is not warming the Earth directly through thermal energy. Right? There's no particles from the sun that are coming over and colliding with particles on the Earth and heating up. It's light. Right? The sun is giving off all this radiation in the form of light. The light comes down and it gets absorbed. And when the light gets absorbed, 
it gets converted to kinetic energy. So when this light comes over, it hits those particles and s makes them vibrate and move more. That's how things get heated up uh, through radiation. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's take another quick break and then we'll finish up. Actually, you know, we're pretty much at the end, so sorry, I didn't realize we were so close to the end. Let's just finish this really quick. It'll only take a minute. <coughs> just want to mention a couple real quick more things uh, before we finish this section. The unit for energy is the joule. Okay, so a joule is based on a specific amount of mass traveling at a specific speed. So if you take two kilograms, two kilogram mass, traveling at one meter per second, that's pretty fast, that has the energy of one joule. Right, that's just, uh, we have to make a standard unit. Right, so now we can compare energy of one thing to energy of another thing. A joule is a unit of energy, it can be used to express any type of energy. So if I have a gamma ray, we said last time gamma ray is a really high energy form of light, that has a certain number of joules associated with it. More joules associated with a gamma ray than with an x-ray or then with uh, UV radiation or something like that. So I can use joules to, uh, to express how much kinetic energy a particle has as it's flying through space. I can use joules to express how much vibrational energy a particle has if it's vibrating. I can use joules to express how much potential energy there is when I pull something away from something else that it's attracted to. So a joule is just a unit of energy. It's just a way of us uh, being able to compare different types of energy and quantify them uh, with calculations.